So our next speaker is Peter Flynn. Uh, Peter was a creator, editor, and podcaster for Winging It in Motown from 2016 to 2022. Uh, he created and co-hosted, for sure, a 200-foot podcast, a show which features interviews with many members of the hockey analytics community. He currently writes at his personal Medium site, and you can find him on Twitter at pflynn42. Uh, welcome, Peter, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, being given this opportunity to be here today. And uh, I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, so I am here today to talk mainly about my project, uh, which is a year of promoting the people who make the things I love. Um, and speaking of things I love, I wanted to start off with uh, one of my favorite pictures ever, which was at CBJ Hack, which I think is the last, uh, it's definitely the last in-person convention I was at. And um, two of my favorite people in the entire world, uh, Megan and Jay, uh, both of whom I would not have met if it wasn't for uh, hockey. And so, you know, it's a big part of my life, even though I'm not really as involved uh, as I used to be. Uh, so I'm going to have uh, basically three segments today. The first one is about promoting, right? That's the main point here. Um, and I'm going to jump right into it. So uh, like Michael said, I spent about five years, I think. I'm really bad with time at Winging It in Motown as a writer, editor, uh, a moderator, which was my least favorite part of uh, moderating comments. Um, and additionally, I was... Uh, I, I, I hosted uh, many episodes of our WIM radio podcast and uh, co-created and co-hosted uh, for sure a 200 foot pod podcast, which is one of the, you know, one of the, uh, my favorite things I've ever done. Um, and so I was, I was doing a lot. Um, and like I said, five years, that's a long time. And after five years, I decided to stop. And when I stopped, I, I, I wrote this article about, um, it was about why I stopped, but then it was about obviously what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and part of the reason I stopped was burnout. Um, you know, it's a lot of work, especially when it's not your primary job to cover a team uh, at the level I was doing it. And it was, it was just a lot. I really enjoyed doing the podcast, but it was a ton of stress. It was a lot of work. Um, but the other reason I stopped was that um, the best way I think I found to say it is that it felt like I wasn't really getting the energy back that I was putting into it. Um, and I, th this article goes into much more detail, but uh, just a short version is it felt like I was doing all this writing. I was you know, doing all this research and working really hard to try to put out content that was informative and entertaining and interesting. And even though I know that people were reading it and I know that people were um, listening, I uh, a lot of times it kind of didn't feel that way. Um, and I realized that a lot of the reason it didn't feel that way is because I didn't really see my work being promoted. Uh, and it kind of, you know, kind of just bummed me out a lot. Um, you know, somebody would be like, oh, hey, that was a really good article. But then like, you know, they didn't share it or anything like that. Um, and, it, you know, it, it got to be a little, a little bit too much after a while. And that's, you know, the main reason I stopped. Um, additionally, I, I, like many people, have imposter syndrome. Uh, I have it very badly uh, in a lot of different aspects. And um, prior to this, this conference, uh, prior to this talk, I, I put out this very scientific poll, highly accurate. Um, and obviously, I'm joking, but I do think from talking to a lot of people in the community, especially a lot of the people who did the type of work that I did, um, I was a lot of people were saying the same thing to me. Um, uh, number one about kind of not, not always feeling like your work was being recognized, but then also, um, about, you know, feeling this, this level of imposter syndrome. And so part of like this little section here is if you're watching this and you feel that way, and that's keeping you from trying to be a part of this community, so many people that are already a part of this community feel that way. All right. We all like, I, I'm not going to say we all do, but many of us do, um, as you can see here, gold medal Olympians feel this way sometimes, or a lot of the time, I don't know, but don't let that stop you. Um, and I think that, you know, with a lot of issues, we kind of have to talk about it so that other people know that they're not alone. Um, my favorite story with imposter, about imposter syndrome uh, that really highlights this point uh, is uh, the, the writer Neil Gaiman was at a conference 
Um, and, you know, he's a very well-respected writer, you know, published, you know, ton of books and a lot of praise. And he felt like, I don't know why I'm here. Like everybody here is so much more accomplished than I am. And he struck up a conversation with a, an older gentleman. Uh, and they started talking about how they had the same name. They were both named Neil. And the older gentleman looked at him and he said, oh, man, I don't know. Why does anybody here want to talk to me? All I did, all I did is go where I was sent. And then Neil Gaiman looks at him and he says, yeah but it was the moon, right? And so again, if you feel this way, a lot of people feel this way. You know, Neil Armstrong feels this way sometimes, which is pretty incredible. Um, so what I decided to do is I didn't wanna really just have this pity party for myself where um, it's like, oh, I wish things could be different. Um, I wanted to try to do something to make things different. I wanted to try to help other people. And so what I did is I started this project where it started off <laughs> where I was doing it every day and that turned out to be way too much. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have the time or energy to be able to do it, um, to keep up with it. So I went to three times, uh, uh, you know, three times a week. And then from there, um, I, I was you know, still doing it and I was really enjoying it. But again, it was still a lot of work. As of right now, it's on hiatus, but I am going to uh, bring it back in some way. I just have to figure out the best way to, to accomplish what I'm trying to do. Um, and it'll have to be a little bit of a smaller scale. But part of the thing is I want to kind of talk about it today and maybe I can inspire other people to kind of do similar things. Um, so how can you help, right? That's kind of one of the big things here is just like this, right? Um, on Twitter, it's great to, to like tweets, like that's awesome. But what really helps people uh, to gain a following and to gain traction is to retweet, but then especially to quote tweet and add something to it. And obviously you're not going to want to be throwing all this stuff into your, you know, people's timeline. You know, if you're doing this, you know, 20 times a day, people are going to get a little annoyed at you. Um, but it's pretty easy to do it like once a day, you know, just to say, I'm going to do this once a day. I'm going to find something really cool. And I'm going to share it with people so that, the person who's making this can kind of get some can get some promotion, and I think that's really helpful. Uh, so that's one way that you can you can help. It's pretty simple, but I do think it goes a long way as somebody who's been on the other side of it. My second part today is how, in addition to promoting people, we need to make sure that we're being welcoming. And I think that overall we do a good job, but I think that there's definitely ways that we can improve. Uh, and again, I'm using the word we because I'm in court. I'm including myself here. Um, the Hockey Graphs Mentorship Program is a really great example of an idea like this where people who wouldn't otherwise have access to these, uh, you know, these opportunities to work with an amazing mentor have that opportunity. And this is such a great idea. It's such a great program. And I think it can be expanded um, to other companies. Uh, I'm pretty sure I heard Megan uh, Cheka talk about how they were doing some uh, like a mentorship program, I believe, you know, but this is something where I, I, I would like to see the community even do more, right? We're doing a good job. Let's do more. Um, the bottom part is uh, at the CBJ hack. This is something that I put together, but at the, but at the same time, it's not about me. I never would have thought to do this if it wasn't for Chris Watkins uh, the year before talking about how he wanted to buy tickets for people who couldn't go to RitHack and so, so they could go. And the short version, and again, you can read this article. I'm going to link to everything uh, that I discuss. I'm going to link to my slides and every article I talk about um, on Twitter right after this uh, presentation. But basically, uh, this never would have happened if it wasn't for Chris and then if it wasn't for the generosity of the hockey community, because we got so many donations that we were able to help out. I forget the numbers now, but it was like it was over 10 people to attend the conference and we covered travel. Right. Because, you know, just the ticket cost of a, of a conference is, is pretty tough, but then also travel. Right. And I do think that we're doing a really good job at hockey conferences of making sure that the barrier to entry is low and that people can go. Now, this graph might be a little bit inaccurate. Some of these numbers might be slightly off, but I think the point remains. Um, hockey conferences are doing a great job at doing this. And some of the conferences listed here, they did have uh, programs where people could get free tickets and things like that. Um, again, I do want to take this opportunity to address really quickly this idea of being welcoming, right? Because I do think we do a good job overall, but you know, this, these were a couple of responses to my poll. And I do think that these are valid. Um, you know, it, sometimes people really don't feel like they're involved. And again, sometimes that's kind of like imposter syndrome, but it could also be, 
you know, as much as we might not want to think about it, I do think that some of the hockey analytics community, and, and again, I'm including myself here, we can be a little like it's kind of group based and maybe clicky a little bit, even if we're not intending for it to be. And it might be hard for people on the outside to to feel like they can be a part of that. Um, and on the bottom here, I have this tweet from Tembi um, and I reached out and I talked to him and, you know, it was a private conversation, but he, he made a lot of good points. Um, and I'm not talking about people who are, you know, talking in bad faith about how, oh, analytics sucks and things like that. I'm talking about, you know, people who are trying to um, add to the community, trying to maybe look at things from a different uh, lens. And we need to just make sure that we're welcoming to everybody. Um, lastly, I really believe strongly that while promoting is amazing, welcoming, we have to welcome if we're not going to be able to promote, uh, promote people, but then we also have to protect them. All right. And so this last issue here goes beyond hockey analytics community to the hockey community in general. We can't promote people's work if we don't welcome them into the community. And none of it matters if we don't protect them. And far too often, members of our community are being subjected to targeted online harassment. Um, when that happens, typically the people who try to address the issue, they know that they're opening themselves up to the same garbage, but they do it anyway. But far too often, people with large platforms in the hockey community remain silent. And often this hatred comes from the followers of one company whose names many people won't even mention on Twitter because they know that they'll be targeted next. Hockey partners with this company on a team and league level. And when Gord Miller uh, explained why he was not going to do this Spit and Chicklins podcast, he was subjected to this fire hose of hatred. More people with large platforms need to speak out as well and influence teams and leagues not to partner with Barstool, because while the people who are responsible for this toxicity are to blame, this can only start to get better if people with major influence like national media, et cetera, speak out and do something to help stop it. And I feel that I would be remiss if I didn't use this platform to highlight this issue. Um, so I hope that my discussion of why I feel promoting the work of others is so important inspires other people to do the same. But we can't do that if we don't welcome them into our community. And we, if we don't protect the members of our community, then none of it matters. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who organized this conference for this opportunity to share these thoughts with you. And I hope everybody enjoys the amazing talks and the panels that are on the way. Thank you, Peter. Um, we maybe have a time for a question or two for Peter. Uh, if you'd like to put that in, just use the Q and A. Um, I guess button or icon there in the Zoom window, uh, and we'll give a couple of minutes. And um, I, I, uh, I, I, I guess an extra set of thanks, Peter, um, for broaching this topic, which I know is uh, is one that's not easy, but uh, is greatly appreciated. Thanks. <laughs> Um, okay, um, but let's, uh, we've got a couple of, uh, we have one question and then uh, one comment. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll do both of those and then we need to move on. But uh, Mike asks, um, did you find that lifting others up gave you back some of the energy you felt you were losing when you were quote, writing into the void? Um, and he notes, uh, I find that lifting others up gives me a lot of energy. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. Um, I mean, that's why when I was sitting around, like I was trying to, like, I, I definitely spent some time wallowing in self-pity. Uh, and I, I kind of think I needed to, cause I think, you know, we kind of need to do things like that to process situations. Um, but eventually I decided that I could be bitter. And again, some of this was probably in my head. I mean, I, I don't know, like maybe a large percentage of it was my head, you know, like we, we don't always look at things objectively when we're talking about emotions. And I think that, um, you know, I basically just decided I could either kind of be upset about it and let that kind of ruin, you know, the way I feel about things, or I could, you know, try to be an example and try to do something positive. I mean, you know, one of my slides said that uh, I was trying to figure out the best way to phrase this. I mean, um, I think in my life, I've learned that like the best thing that we can do in life is to help other people and to impact other people. And 
you know, when we're gone, that's what people are going to remember. They're going to remember the impact that we had on other people, not necessarily what we did for ourselves. And so I, I tried to do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then I'll just um, pass along, right? Idris writes, thank you for your courage, Peter. Uh, another anonymous attendee says, great presentation. Um, and so that's, that's, that's wonderful stuff. Um, so uh, thank you again for that. Uh, and you can follow Peter on Medium and Twitter. Uh, and we're gonna, we're out of time here, but uh, really appreciate that, Peter. Thank you. Um, excellent. Um, we are moving right along here.